Hey, what is going on everybody? It is Rob, AKA The Diligent Dev. And a few months ago, I shot a video going over how to create a REST API using Firebase functions. And since then, that video has gotten a decent amount of views and I've gotten a lot of questions out of it. And one of the questions was how to implement data validation for the data that you're passing to the API. So that's exactly what we're gonna cover in this video. So let's go ahead and jump over to the computer and get right into it. Okay, so here we are over the computer, and since this tutorial is going to build on top of another video I did going over how to create a REST API using Firebase functions, we're just gonna go ahead and clone that repository and add to it. Now, if you'd like to watch the original video, and I highly suggest you do, I will link it on the screen right now, and I will also put a link to the, in the description. In the description, you can also find a link to this Bitbucket repo we're about to clone. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click this clone button and I'm gonna go ahead and copy this out of here. Then I'm gonna open up a new terminal, CD into my desktop directory, and then paste that git clone command in there and it's gonna go ahead and clone the project for us. Now that the project's been cloned, I've gone ahead and opened it up in Visual Studio Code. And what we're gonna do is delete some files out of here so that when we create our Firebase project or you create your Firebase project, it's actually pointing at the project when we initialize Firebase inside of this code base. So what we're gonna do is come up here and delete this Firebase RC. We're also gonna delete Firebase.json. Firestore indexes and Firestore rules. Next, we're going to head over to firebase.google.com. Go ahead and create an account if you don't already have one and then click go to console. We're going to add a new project and we're just gonna call this fur funk data val. And then I'm gonna click continue and I'm not going to enable Google Analytics. And once it's done creating the project, I will be right back. And now that the project's been created successfully, we're gonna go ahead and click on Cloud Firestore here in the left-hand menu. And we're gonna click Create Database. We're going to start it in test mode. Now, I would not recommend this for a production application, but in terms of our tutorial, it's going to be fine. Make sure you brush up on Firestore rules before you would release a production application because as it stands right now, this will allow anyone to read and write to this database. We're gonna click Next. We'll just choose the US central location, hit enable, and once it's done provisioning the Cloud Firestore, I will be right back. Okay, so now that Cloud Firestore has been provisioned successfully, what we're gonna do is install the Firebase CLI. So I'm gonna open up my terminal again, and I'm gonna run the following command, npm install dash G for global Firebase dash tools. Now, if you're on a Mac, you'll have to put sudo in front of this and type in your password, but on a Windows machine, it should work just fine. I already have it installed, so I'm not gonna run this command. I'm just gonna go ahead and back this out. But go ahead and pause the video here, and once it's installed, come back, and we're gonna have to run another command, and that is Firebase login. Now I'm already logged in and it recognizes me here, but if you are not logged in, it's gonna go ahead and open a browser window and prompt you to log in so that the CLI is synced with your Firebase account. And now that the Firebase CLI has been synced with our account, I've gone ahead and opened up the project again in Visual Studio Code, and we're going to open up a new terminal. And I'm gonna run the following command, Firebase init. It's gonna ask us which Firebase features we want to add to this project, and we're just going to check functions by hitting the space bar and then hitting enter. We're going to use an existing project, and we're just gonna go ahead and grab that project that we created earlier out of this list and hit enter. What language we're going to be using JavaScript. Do we wanna use ESLint? I'm going to say yes. Now, a lot of files already exist because like I said earlier, this is an existing project. So we are not going to overwrite the package.json. We don't wanna overwrite the ESLint or our index.js. We're not going to overwrite the gitignore. Do we want to install dependencies now? I'm going to hit Y for yes and hit enter. And now Firebase has been successfully initialized in our project and we can see we have our new Firebase RC and our Firebase JSON. And if we go ahead and look in this functions folder that was created by the Firebase CLI, we see we have an independent project in here. It has its own node modules and package.json and inside of the index.js is where our code actually lives. 
Now, if you want a detailed explanation of what this code is doing, go ahead and watch the original video that I will link in the description. Now, to use a REST API with Firebase functions, we need to import the express package. This will give you the concept of a git, post, put, delete, and all the other endpoints that come along with a REST API. Now, since we're using the express framework, we can go ahead and tap into a ton of different plugins that we can use that will make a lot of different things easier. But in terms of this video, we're gonna be talking about validation, and we are going to be using the express validator plugin. So I'll leave a link to this in the description. And what we have here is just a package that we're going to go ahead and install using NPM. And if we look at some basic usage, we're going to pull the body and validation result out of this package. And on our post request, we will put some middleware in here that's going to check the different properties that we're going to be passing in and using some functions that are supplied by Express Validator or validator.js to validate the data that we're passing in. Now, if we go look at the validation chain API and inside of here, you can look at the standard validators and we click here. You can see that there are a ton of different validators that are supplied by validator.js that is going to make the validation of our data extremely easy and extremely quick. So let's go ahead and head back to the getting started. We're going to copy this command. We're going to head back to our project. We're going to CD into the functions folder, and then we're going to run that command. Now that it's been installed, we can go back to their documentation, go to this basic usage. We'll copy this line right here where we're pulling out the body and validation result. We'll go to our index.js and right underneath our express app, we'll go ahead and just import that. Now, as our API stands right now, the only endpoint that we're going to be passing in data is the post request where we create the user. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and created a text document and we're going to be adding these validations to a user creation. So we'll have email, it will be required and we'll verify that it's a valid email. First and last name will be required. We will pass in an age, it'll be required and it must be an integer. We'll pass in a password, it'll be required with a min length of six characters a user type, and we'll make it so that it either has to be admin or customer, and a language that is optional, but if it is added, it must be JavaScript, Python, or C Sharp. So what I'm gonna do is just pin this to the side of the screen, and pin this over here. We'll make this a little bit smaller, so that way we can see what's going on here. And then if we look, at the express validator documentation you'll see that on this post request we're going to pass in an array right here and it acts as middleware now once it gets down into our function body we can call this validation request that will go ahead and validate all these properties and then if we have any errors we're going to go ahead and return a 400 and an array of all the errors that we have so let's go ahead and minimize this and right above our post API endpoint, I'm going to create an array. I'm going to call it user creation validators. And inside of here is where we will stick all of our validators. The first validator is going to be on email and it's required. And we're going to check that it is a valid email. So we're going to say body email dot not empty as it's required. And then we'll chain another validator called is email. Next, we'll go to the body and we'll verify the first name. And it is just required, so we'll just say not empty. Then last name. And this is also just required, so we're going to check that it's not empty. Next, we're going to do age. And we say that it is required. So we're going to do not empty. And we also want to check that it is an integer. So we're going to chain another validator on here. And we're going to say is int. Then we're going to do the password. So we'll say password. Not empty as it's required. And then we're going to do is length. We're going to pass an object in here and we're going to say min five. 
So it's required and it must be five and we actually said it must be six characters long. So we'll do a min of six. Then we're going to do a user type. So we'll say body user type. And we said for this one that it is required. So not empty. And then it must be one of two user types. It's either gotta be an admin or a customer. So we're gonna say dot is in. We're going to pass it an array. And inside of this array, we'll say admin or customer. So what that's doing is checking that it's not empty, that it's required, and that if we do pass it in, it either has to be admin or customer. Next, we're going to do the language. And I've got to wrap this in quotes. And we're going to say that this one is optional. But if it is passed in, we're going to say is in. We're going to pass an array again. And it either has to be JavaScript, Python, or C sharp. Now that we have all of our validators, we can just go ahead and copy this and add this as middleware. So we'll put it right between the routes and the actual function for our endpoint. To use these validators right above the const user, we're going to say const errors, set that equal to validation result and pass in the request. And then we're gonna say if exclamation point errors dot that is empty. So if we have any errors, we're going to drop down into this if block, we're going to return res dot status, we're going to return a 400, we're going to append some JSON onto this, and pass it errors. And do our errors dot array to convert it to an array. I'm going to hit Alt Shift F to format everything. I'm going to go ahead and save. We're going to come down here and we're going to run the following command in the terminal. Firebase deploy dash dash only functions. And once it's done deploying the functions, I will be right back. Okay, so as we can see, our functions deployed successfully. So we're going to go ahead and open up Firebase and I've clicked on the functions tab right here. Go ahead and ignore this. It should use the latest version of Node. This is an old project. But anyways, we see we have our endpoints of hello world and user, and we have this URL here that we can hit to make our request to our user endpoints. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this out. Now I'm gonna open up a program called Postman, and I will leave a link to this in the description. It's how you test API endpoints. I'm gonna open a new tab in here. Now the endpoint that we put our validations on is the post endpoint of user. So I'm gonna to go to post, I'm going to paste in the URL. And if we don't pass a request body at all, we should get all of the errors. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit that. And we see we get our errors back. So we get two invalid values for email. And basically what that means is one is for the required and another one is to check if it's email. Since we required first and last name, it's also in here as an error age is error and we don't require it and it's not an integer so we're going to get two on that we have password which is required and also that it is not min length um, it didn't min meet the min length validation we have the user type for both because they are required and they also do not meet that now language is not throwing an error because it is an optional field so let's go ahead and test this with a valid body so what i'm going to do is i'm going to click on body raw we're going to select JSON and let's go ahead and build out our body for this. So we'll wrap this in curly braces and we're going to say email. And we'll just say test at test.com. We're going to pass in a password. And we'll just do password one, two, three, and I misspelled password. 
we have a first name. We'll do the, or we'll just do diligent. Last name, dev, we'll pass in an age, and I'm 34. Uh, what else did we have? We had user type, and we'll pass in admin. And I can't remember what the other fields are, so let's have the API return to me what I'm missing. So we'll go ahead and pass that in. And that must have been everything that was required because we got a 201 created. So let's head back to Firebase. Let's go to our real-time database, or I'm sorry, Cloud Firestore. Now we have something in the users collection and all of the information that we passed in. So let's go ahead and manipulate some of this and see what kind of errors we get back. So we'll just go ahead and delete this off. I'm gonna hit send. And we got an error because of this right there. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit send again. And what we're seeing here is that our user type is coming back as invalid values. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take that off. And let's put the comma back up here. And let's go ahead and manipulate age and pass something in that's not an integer. And you'll see we get an error. It gives us the value back, says it's invalid param age uh, location is in the body. So, we will put this back. Let's pass in a bad email. We see we get a an error back um, that the pram email had an invalid value. Let's go ahead and pass in an invalid language. So we'll say language and we'll pass CSS. This should fail because even though this is an optional parameter, it is not one of the ones that we specified is allowable. So it went ahead and failed. So let's go ahead and change this to JavaScript. Pass it in. And we're gonna see that we got a new user and we passed in JavaScript as the language. Now, if we go ahead and remove the body again and we go ahead and send it, you'll see that we get all of our errors again and you'll see that these errors are not very descriptive and it might be very confusing to the front end developer if you're working with a front end and a back end developer that they're getting two email messages here that they're invalid values. So let's set them up to something a little bit more descriptive so that when our front end developer is working on our application and they send this, they're not just getting invalid values. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our project and on this email right here, if it hits this not empty, so this is our required, we're gonna say with message, and we're gonna pass it email is required. And then on our email, we can do the same thing. We can say with message, and we can say email is invalid. So now we can pass custom messages back so that our front end developer will have an easier time figuring out exactly what is invalid here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and deploy these functions again, and I will be right back after they are finished. So the function was deployed successfully, and I went ahead and hit send, but we'll do it again just to show you. And we see now we're getting some very specific messages back from our validators. And so instead of having two invalid values here, we see that email is required and that the email is invalid. We could also apply this to age since we have two separate error messages here and also on the password. So you see this could really help out a front end developer and give them a specific error message so that they could fix what they're passing to the back end. So as you can see, the Express Validator plugin allows us to implement data validation and keep our data integrity in our database very easily. Now, if you got any value out of this, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like and subscribe button. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, go ahead and drop a line in the comment section below. I try to answer those as frequently as I can. And until next time, happy coding.